Welcome back to the show where we run you through all the Dolphins news you need to know about. We're running through all the Dolphins news you need to know about. Then we play the clip of the week. And then we run you through the fans' questions where we answer, obviously, fans' comments and concerns. Uh, and obviously, part of the news will be we, we will uh, go through the box score of uh, the game against Indianapolis. So... Let's start with the news you need to know about. Now, some of this news you probably already know about, especially if you've listened to this podcast. Uh, you're probably a pretty hardcore Dolphins fan, but we'll run you through some of the obvious ones very quickly. This first news story comes from Pro Football Rumors. Dolphins' Preston Williams is going to be out for the rest of the season. Preston Williams' promising rookie season will end at the midway point. The rookie wide receiver left Sunday's, oh, excuse me, left Sunday's game early, and Brian Flores confirmed Monday he will not return in 2019. Williams suffered a torn ACL, according to Cameron Wolf of ESPN.com. The undrafted rookie played well in Miami's win, hauling in two touchdown passes uh, during a five-reception 72-yard day, but the Colorado State product left the game with a knee issue, one that will delay his opportunity to build on the, his early season su- success. Williams will likely miss all Dolphins' on-field work until training camp. So, for some stats that you guys might care about, Preston Williams caught 32 passes for 428 yards and three touchdowns in his first eight games in the NFL. He was on pace to become just the second, uh, the second first Dolphins rookie wideout to surpass 800 yards since Chris Chambers in 2001. So uh, he would he would have become the second receiver, the rookie receiver, to pass eight to pass 800 yards since 2001 since 2001 when when uh, Chris Chambers did it. Um, which would have been pretty cool, but, uh, yeah, I mean, he was, he was getting better, you know, he had a great off season, and it really didn't carry into the regular season, and what I mean by that, he was putting up good numbers, but, you know, he had a lot that he left on the field, like, he had a lot of plays that he left on the field, uh, due to drops, um, and we didn't really see that from him in preseason we didn't see that from him in the, some of the off season news that we got and we didn't see that from him in college so i took it as like oh this is just you know he's a rookie the, this is his first nfl action and he progressively got better and better and better and better and you could see that he has the potential to be that number one like x receiver an outside threat that's a dominant threat that we haven't really ever had in dolphins history you know, we've we've had, I would say, like, just on the cusp of great receivers, a lot, like, when you think about all of the receivers that we've had, like, Irving Fryer back in the 90s was really, he had, he had some really good years in the NFL, um, but it wasn't over a long period of time. It wasn't like we had a Calvin Johnson for, like, nine years or something like that that was just dominant. You know, I'm not saying Preston Williams will become that, but he has that ability to be a very very good receiver for a long time um which is you know great uh and hopefully he can and it sucks that he towards acl because you know he had an entire half of a season left he was progressively getting better um hopefully this just doesn't stunt his development as a great player coming back off the acl tear that's the only thing i'm really worried about but yeah he has the potential to be very very good is the point and I'm excited about his future. Moving on from this, Mark Walton, and this comes from Pro Football Rumors, receives a four-game ban. Excuse me. Hours after news of Preston Williams' ACL tear surfaced, the Dolphins will lose another key piece of their offense. Mark Walton received a four-game suspension for violations. Sorry, I don't know why. I'm, sorry about that. For violations of the league's substance abuse policy. Miami turned to Walton in recent weeks. Okay, we know. As Dolphins fans, we know. So, yeah, he's serving a four-game suspension. So, now that the Colts game is over, it's obviously he's got, we've got three more games without him. Um, this is a huge, huge blow to the Dolphins, especially after watching the Colts game. Kalen Balaj, I'm off the bandwagon. I'm off the bus. He's not a good player at all. You know, you know when I was watching the game... He he has the stumble syndrome. His balance is terrible. He doesn't have good balance as a running back. It's it's god awful. He's very he's like a he's like a horse that was just born and he's learning to walk. Like that's what his running style looks like. His vision isn't great. He can't really he doesn't make clean enough cuts. And when he does, he doesn't keep his balance and he's not able to c- 
cut cleanly enough uh, to get the full benefit of the hole. He just doesn't. Um, a lot of the time, especially in this game, I felt like he could have gotten more yards, but he really just put his head down and was like, all right, I'm going to get two yards right here, and he was set in his ways. That happens all way too often with him. And like I said, the biggest issue with him is whether he's catching a pass out of the backfield or he's trying to you know, change direction, he's starting to put his foot in the ground uh, and either try to make someone miss or something like that. He can't because his balance is god-awful. Like I said, he's like a deer that was just born. He just, you know, he's, he's got the case of the stumbles. And if you go to the doctor, you're like, oh, this running back's got the case of the stumbles. There's no fix in that, uh, in my opinion. His, his confidence looks shot to me. Um, you know, he just doesn't do anything well enough on the field. You know, when coming out of college, coming out of Arizona State, he was supposed to be this great receiving back. He hasn't lived up to that. He hasn't lived up to the some of the stuff that the flashes that we saw last year with him. And it's just complete. He just regressed at a very high rate, and it's unfortunate because he does have talent. But from what we've seen so far of him, it's not. He's just not a good player. Um, and I thought, and we'll get into this later. But when Patrick, what is his name, Laird or Layard, I can't remember how you say his name, the running, the undrafted rookie out of Cal, played better than him when he was in the game. And Mark Walton, despite his preseason results, because if we go back to preseason, Mark Walton did not look good. He is the best back on the team. You know, when he was playing, he was the best back on the team. Um, so, yeah, this Mark Walton thing is a big hit to the Dolphins, even though I think, in my opinion, watching this team over the last few weeks, we'll get into this more. I don't want to stay on this topic for too long. They're a better passing team than they are a running team. It's not. It's really not even that close. They are way, way better at passing the ball. And even with the O-line, they've gotten so much better at pass protection uh, it's crazy, honestly. It's honest to God insane how much improvement we've seen with that group in pass blocking. Like, it's crazy, dude. It's insane. Like, thinking about the talent that's out there and how well they've produced over recent weeks is insane. Um, but with all that being said, yeah, the running back is it's a big bat. It's a, it's, a, it's a big issue. It's a very big issue um, that needs to be addressed in the offseason because, like I said, I just don't think Kalen Balazs is the answer. This next news story comes from Pro Football Rumors. Uh, Dolphins wave Robert Kandichi, or however the heck you say his name, the former first-round pick that Arizona took all the way back in, what, 2016? Yeah, 26, 26 overall pick. Just hasn't panned out. It is what it is, man. It really doesn't hurt the Dolphins at all. Plus, the, the, some of the young D linemen on this team have been playing pretty productive ball. Uh, this next news story we'll run through very quickly because I'm sure you guys have heard enough about it. Uh, this comes from Pro Football Rumors. Dolphins won't activate Cordrea Tankersley. The Dolphins will not activate cornerback Cordrea Tankersley from the physically unable to perform list by today's deadline, according to Barry Jackson of the Miami Herald. Tankersley suffered ACL just over a year ago and has been working his way back to full health ever since the 2017 third-round third pick uh, came back to practice in October, opening a three-week window during which Miami had to either activate Tankersley or keep him on the physically unable to perform list for the remainder of the year. After assessing his progress, the Dolphins have decided on the latter option that they will not activate him. This is an interesting because he has potential. You know, he was when he you know his rookie year was probably his best year in some of those games, uh, but. Especially early on. He was playing very well early on in his rookie year. And what we've seen from Brian Flores and his ability to just put people together and have a good game plan and have them execute that game plan is phenomenal. And for him to get his hands on this guy, you know, he's basically been a DB's coach his entire career. and He's developed some of the, you know, some of New England's best players in that secondary. Um, it's interesting to see what he can do with Cordrea Tankersley. So hopefully he can stick around and become something. All right, we got two news stories left, and we'll get into the box score, because I'm excited to talk about this game. Uh, this next news story comes from Pro Football Rumors. Dolphins offered Rashad Jones to Steelers before Minka Fitzpatrick. The Dolphins were shopping veteran safety Rashad Jones this summer, and the Steelers, who ha uh, had to make it clear to their rival teams that they were in the market for secondary help, were an obvious match. 
Miami did indeed attempt to deal Jones to Pittsburgh at the start of the season. However, the Steelers said they preferred Minka Fitzpatrick, though the Dolphins initially suggested Fitzpatrick was not being going to be moved. Of course, Miami quickly changed its stance excuse me, in regard in, 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 in regard to the matter, and said it would deal Fitzpatrick if a first-rounder was included. Um, the report says several teams were willing to meet with the Dolphins' asking price, but Miami chose Pittsburgh's offer because it believed the 2020 first-rounder from the Steelers would be higher than those of the other suitors. Of course, that may not turn out to be the case, as Fitzpatrick has proved provided a jolt to the Steelers' defense and has helped Pittsburgh uh, climb all the way back to five and four. We don't know what's going to happen because there's still a lot of games left. So I'm not going to sit here and say that we're not going to get a high pick because who the heck knows, dude? They've only won five games. But it's an interesting story. I mean, obviously, I was against this trade from the jump. You know, I haven't changed my opinion at all. Like I told, you know, I didn't tell anybody, but I, you know, in this podcast, I voiced my concerns about this. And you know, I'm not going to say I was right because I, you know, I don't want to be a jerk or anything like that because I hate the fact that I'm right about this. But, you know, Minka, in my opinion, and I've said this before, was the best player on our defense. And I and I, and I know that sounds crazy to a lot of people. You know, I felt that his, 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 the way he plays the game is so special. Um, you know, he rarely does, he never really does anything wrong at all. You know, he did his job perfectly, and uh, we're seeing that in in Pittsburgh Um, and his ability to just play the game at a very high level. It is what it is. We have to move on. You know, we can't lament on these things because, you know, I'm very excited of the direction this team's going in because of the coaching staff that they have assembled and some of the people that they've put in the front office making the the decisions. Um, It's all starting to come together. And it's really exciting. Um, I'm very happy with where this team and this organization is headed. So I'm not actually that upset about it because of that. It could be a lot worse. Let's just put it that way. All right, this last news story comes from Pro Football Rumors. I don't know why I'm so hiccupy right now, but it is what it is. Uh, okay, this final news story comes from Pro Football Rumors. Uh, NFL draft experts and scouts were watching this week's game between LSU and Alabama. General Manager Chris Greer attended it himself. So if you didn't know that, Chris Greer went to watch the Alabama-LSU game. If you didn't watch the Alabama-LSU game, LSU ended up holding on to the victory after a pretty vicious comeback by Alabama. Uh, I watched the entire game because of obvious reasons, because you know two of the quarterbacks that were playing in this game have high, you know, they could be a part of this Dolphins team for a long time if they turn out to be what everybody thinks they could be. And, you know, I don't want to get into it because I could talk about it for a while, but, you know, there's a lot of things I took away from that game. Um, I think both of them are going to be very good, uh, for sure. I will say this, I think Alabama and what Tua had to do and some of the throws Tua made and some of the plays he had to make to move the ball, his day was a lot more difficult than what, for some reason, than from what Joe Burrow, had, some of the looks that he threw into. But Joe also made some like, oh, he made that play by himself or that was a great play or he showed great poise right there. He showed great clutch factor or whatever you want to call it. And a lot of those plays too. So you know, Joe Burrow proved himself as well. Uh, so it's an interesting. It's going to be interesting what the Dolphins do with the two. And I don't want to make comparisons and sound like that. You know, uh, I don't want to go too overboard with some of these comparisons. I really don't. I've heard a lot of people compare Tua to Steve Young because he's left-handed, but in the, his accuracy. And how he's just a ridiculous deep ball thrower, and he showed it in that game. If his receivers didn't drop, you know, basically they dropped two touchdowns, in that, and especially in the second half. But, uh, you know, I still feel like two is the best after watching that game. But Joe Burrow is definitely the second best quarterback in college football. I don't even think it's close. Um, I think it's him and two along at the top. And Joe, and I'm not saying this, I'm not saying he's going to become this or whatever the heck, but he reminds me a lot of Tom Brady in the way of. The way he plays the game, and the his Tom's college career, where he all he did was win, 
And all Joe Burrow is doing is winning, and his play style, and his, dude, like, when the game was close, it, just the way he just kept firing it in there, completely cool, calm, and collected, and, you know, everybody brings up the fact that everybody who's been able to beat Alabama has been, a, like, a pretty special mobile quarterback, um, when you think about Deshaun Watson or Johnny Manziel, um, who've been able to beat this to Cam Newton when he, you know, was he, when he was at Auburn. Some of the teams, when uh, Auburn and the Iron Bowl, where they had that, you know, that kind of triple option thing going on, uh, with, what's his name, Marshall? I can't remember his full name. So all of the people that have been able to beat Alabama have had a very athletic quarterback. The, Joe Burrow, he's an athlete, and he scored some rushing touchdowns in this game, but he is a pocket, pa- like, that's the best thing that he does, which is pretty crazy, considering the fact that you look at everybody who's had, especially recent su- success against Nick Saban, have not been pocket passers. That's the most impressive thing to me about it, um, which is pretty cool. You know, I like them both. I think they're both going to be pretty dang good. But he does. He has that. Like I don't know what it is. Like when I, he just reminds me a lot of Brady in that way. Like the swagger that he has, the big moments, the way he plays in those. I mean, he's played in a lot of very close games this year, and you know, against Texas, he played in a very close game. Came out with the win in that game. Obviously against Alabama, played outstanding. Two attack of Aloha is the real deal as well with some of the throws he made in that game where he was he was he could not run out of the pocket. He was hurt. You know, he was resorted to a pocket passer and he played very well. You know, making throws outside of the numbers, inside the numbers. Both of them, I feel like if the Dolphins got either one of the two, are gonna be in good shape. So that's what I have to say about that, just in case you guys were wondering. Because I feel like it was a big it was a big news story. Speaking of quarterbacks and great performances in recent weeks, let's go on to the box score. Uh, which, I mean, who expected any of this to happen, by the way? I know Brian Hoyer played. I know Jacoby Brissett didn't play. But that team should... I mean, that team is very talented and very... Their head coach is great. Their organization is great. Uh, their scheme is great. Um, their head, like I just said, their head coach is extremely smart. Let's just get into this game. I mean, I was so excited. Uh, my heart was pounding the entire game, especially towards the end there. Um, it was a great game, and it gave me... And I think the biggest thing that I take away from this game is, number one, Brian Flores. The amount of confidence I have in this man now is off the, the charts. What, he, what, he, what he's been able to do with this franchise and this team so far with the talent that it has, you've got to think about who is out there playing this game. You talk about L- Ryan Lewis, Nick Needham, you know Jamal Wilkes, who's a good player. He's 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 turning into that. Uh, Parker, I forget his uh, his first name, who got the pick in the end zone. Like some of these players that are on the field are, you know, we're not going to talk about like if they were on other teams. Like we get it. Like it's not a talented roster. And what he's been able to do with them is insanity, dude. Is absolutely crazy. Um, and we've seen that in recent weeks, but it's you know it's starting to really come together and gel. Um, and I cannot be more proud of this, the moves that the Stephen Ross and Chris Greer have made um, to turn this organization around. And I know we've only. The, it's not about the fact that we've won two games. It's not. A, it's the product that's been on the field the last few weeks. You can see a progression in the players and like the, the the ability of Brian Flores to develop some of these guys and the coaching staff that he's assembled to help that out. I mean, it, it is that's the biggest thing I've taken away from this. Is Brian Flores is legit and. The coaching staff that he has assembled and the people in the front office are legit. Um, and I'm very happy with that. You know, people are going to come into this game thinking, oh, you know, we lost the number one spot. These are two... Wh- this is These games are meaningless. That's not true, dude. What he's been able to do with this roster is absolutely crazy. Adam Gase would never have been able to do this. Tony Sperano would never have been able to do this with this roster. Uh, Joe Philbin would never have been able to do this with this roster, to name some recent coaches. This is something that we've really never seen. You know, you think about what Hugh Jackson had 
uh, in Cleveland. Now, granted, he didn't have like a Ryan Fitzpatrick as his quarterback. But the rosters are very similar in the way that you know we were be you know the, the fact that they're not very talented but people are you know we're worse than we're one of the worst teams of all time you know we got all of this hate from the beginning of the year and to see how much better this team has gotten and we didn't just beat the redskins by the way we didn't just beat the jets we beat one of the best teams in the AFC in their stadium and that's very impressive and again the biggest thing i've taken away from this and people are going to you know have their own feelings about this is in the grand scheme of things, I'm just a lot more confident in Brian Flores and his staff and their the culture they're trying to build down here and the direction this team is heading in. I believe in it more now because of this, and I think that's important. And you know, it's that's the biggest thing I've taken away from that. Like, hats off to Brian Flores. You know, he's a he's legit. He's legit, and I'm very very proud, uh, very happy with with what's going on. I'm not proud. I guess proud's not the word. I'm just I feel a l- just a lot better um, about where this this organization is going, and I think people should look at it in that light because it is there. If you can find, like, if you notice it, it's there. Like this, this there is a noticeable progression with a lot of these players. Even Nick Needham in preseason, he was ter- he was god awful in preseason, and he's so much better than he was then. Like what they've been able to do, like I've and, I, and I'm repeating myself. With this roster is ridiculous, and I'm very and with the offensive line. That's a great example of it. Like from where they started, like look at the Redskins game, and then look at them now. Like it's night and day. It's completely different, and that that is a that is a testament to the, how good this coaching staff is. And again, it just makes me more confident where this team is heading. So let's get into the box score. The Dolphins pull out the upset, sixteen to twelve. Um, which just all around Brian Flores bringing a uh, great defensive game plan to hold the close to 12 points. Uh, let's start with the defense because I think that's where we should start. Brian Flores, or excuse me, Brian Flores. Brian Hoyer finished the day 18 of 39 uh, passing for 204 yards, one touchdown, and three, count them, three interceptions. Let's go, boys, especially in that secondary. Did a great job. Uh, Rushing, Marlon Mack finished with 19 carries for 74 yards, and he averaged three yards a carry on the ground. Jordan Wilkins, three he had three carries in this game for 20 yards, and uh, Naheem Hines had three carries for 14 yards. The Colts' leading receiver was Eric Ebron with five receptions for 56 yards and zero touchdowns. Their second leading receiver was Jack Doyle with three receptions for 44 yards and 14 yards a catch with one tub. Chester Rogers had two grabs for 31, and that pretty much rounds out the 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 uh, receiving leaders for the Indianapolis Colts. So as you can see from the stats, now the personnel that the Colts mainly use, especially when they're in the shotgun, is two tight end sets. They all they want they want Eric Ebron and Jack Doyle on the field at the same time, and that allows their offensive line for them to play through that offensive line and play to their strengths, which is the running game, and play action and RPOs off of that. That's what they want to do. And I thought in the perfect example of this is just how when I talk about adjustments in-game and game planning, the perfect example for this, the Colts used the same RPO on the fourth and short. Was it fourth and three? Or maybe it was even shorter than that, that we ended up stopping when Brian Horner scrambled out and he didn't get it. They used that same play, I think at least either two times before that, or maybe it was just once, to uh, with a lot of success because the running game was starting to kind of get going a little bit, and they were able to run some of that RPO stuff and hit their tight ends uh, quickly over the middle or in the flat. So that's something we were struggling to defend. Whatever the adjustments were in that game and what Brian or Patrick or whoever adjusted to it, Again, that's coaching. On that fourth down play, they run that same play that we were struggling to defend. It's no one is open on that play. Perfect coverage. Perfect coverage. Perfect defense. To the point where Brian Hoyer broke the pocket. Because again, this defensive line is not the greatest in the world. Still nothing open. 
had the pump fake and tried to take it himself, and obviously he falls short of the first down, which is one of the bigger plays in the game. That's coaching. That's adjusting. That is something that is great to see. And, you know, we haven't seen in a long time, especially on defense, dude. Like, definitely not on defense for the last over five years. Like, maybe not even ever uh, in terms of this decade of Dolphins football, especially not this decade and or maybe even the previous decade to it. Like, that was coaching. And that was a great example of coaching and adjusting. Um, so good job by them. Uh, good job by the Dolphins getting in the right. Because as soon as they ran that play, I was like, man, this is going to be tough to stop. Because they could probably, again, they were running it down our throats. And for them to be that prepared and disciplined on that play to stop it is, again, a testament to coaching. Uh, and overall, this defense played very well. You know, uh, let's see here. I'll, get, I'll tell you. So obviously, I'll tell you who finished with the three picks here. So just get it right. Nick Needham with a with a pick that should have closed it out, but thanks to the refs, uh, we ran it three times in a row. Bobby McCain with a beautiful interception on a corner out, which was covered and it was a little overthrown, and he ended up picking it off. And Stephen Parker, that's right, uh, number twenty six, uh, had the which whether it's a touchdown or not, who knows? But had the interception in the end zone um, on Eric Ebron. But a great play by him, regardless of just keeping. Uh, Keep to keep fighting and finish that play strong. For some other guys that I want to note that played phenomenal, Jerome Baker he had a great day, blitzing, covering, um, sideline to sideline, everything. He did a, a tremendous job today. He had a sack in this game to knock him out of field goal range. He was just balling out all day long. Uh, some other people I want to note: Raekwon McMillan continues to have a strong season under Brian Flores. Uh, as for some other guys, Eric Rowe, who had a good game, should have had a pick uh, against Eric Ebron, um, but he kind of miscalculated it. Uh, but he had great coverage for most of the day, uh, so good for him. Finally, we get a good day out of him. Charles Harris came, coming, coming up with uh, one of the biggest plays of the day, uh, dumping a running back for a loss of three or four yards. Uh, he played decent. Um, Sam Aguavin had a huge stop. Uh, on a run play uh, for a loss of three or four yards, which was huge, and they ended up having to settle for three in the, on that drive. Ryan Lewis, who had a solid day all around, uh, to name some guys on the defense. Christian Wilkins had a solid day. Uh, let's see here. Jamal Wiltz had a very good day as well. Uh, Jamal Wiltz, or however you say his name. Uh, and again, I think the biggest thing on this defense and what we've seen so far in terms of future stars is Jerome Baker and Eric Rowe. I did not mean to say Eric Rowe. Uh, I, I meant Jerome Baker and Raekwon McMillan are legit, and they're gonna, they're very, very good, and they're very, very good together. Uh, and that's that's awesome, dude. I think they're going to be a pretty dang good duo for, for many moons to come. Uh, so good for them. Again, this defense was well coached. They executed well. They played a great game all game long. They were disciplined. No blown coverages. This the, the scheme, the great coaching that was in this game was on full display, and is the reason we won this game. Uh, and the development of players is the reason we won this game. Um, and just a great job by the coaching staff and the players, obviously. Um, <clears throat> just an all around awesome day on defense. Uh, so let's get into the offensive side of the football. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick finished the day 21 of 33 passing the ball for 169 yards, zero touchdowns, and one interception. He That's not true. He had a um, rushing touchdown in this game. That was huge, obviously. That put us up 10 to nothing. Caleb Blodge finished with 20 carries for 43 yards. He averaged almost a yard a carry, but... He finished today two yards a carry. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick was the second leading rusher with four carries for 23 yards. And Patrick Laird uh, had two carries for four yards. Um, but at least he could keep his balance. Uh, Receiving-wise, Devontae Parker led the team with five receptions for 69 yards. Allen Hurts for two catches for 32. Mike Gesicki, three catches for 28. Uh, and Jakeem Grant finished with two catches for 15 yards. So those are your stats. The first thing I want to talk about is how good Ryan Fitzpatrick has been playing. And I don't want to uh, stay on this for too long, but he is playing at a very high level um, for what is around him. And I'm very, I mean, good for him, man. 
uh, good for him. He is he again, and I, I'm gonna about to repeat myself. He is playing very high level football uh, for the talent that is around him, and I feel like that's going unnoticed. Some of the plays that he was able to make on his own in this game were spectacular, avoiding sacks, keeping drives alive, um, making throws on the run. You know, scoring that rushing touchdown. He had a nice play where he spun out of a sack and found Devontae Parker for a third and long for a first down. Things like that are, you know, something that you just don't get with a normal quarterback. And he's playing, at a, again, at a very high level. You know, this game could have been a lot worse for the Colts uh, if we were able to hit on some of those things. Like I said, there's a lot of... I don't know if you want to call it bad luck, whatever you want to call it. There was a lot of that in this game. You know, Ryan Fitzpatrick unfortunately missed Alan Hearns for a potential touchdown to huge gain on an RPO, um, where there was no one in front of Alan Hearns. He was just going to run down the sideline. Uh, what else? Oh, he missed the throw to Miles Gaskin on a little swing uh, hot route. Uh, where the Colts sent a blitz, and he would have walked in for a touchdown. And I think Justin Houston had batted the football, and that's the reason why it was behind him. So again, just bad luck there. The refs taking Ryan Fitzpatrick out of the game after a helmet-to-helmet hit on the previous drive. There had been an entire defensive series at that had been over at that point, and they didn't check him in, and for some reason, they had decided to do that when he was going back into the game. Very weird. Don't understand what the heck was going on there. And the Dolphins end up running the ball three times in a row, which was weird. I was like, I know Josh is in the game, but at least try to get the first down. But they didn't. They ran the ball three times, and we weren't really able to run the ball all day, as you could hear from me reading those, some of those stats. Um, so there was a lot of weird stuff that could have, I could have been talking about as things of reasons why we didn't win the game. But uh, thankfully, we we still won this game. Uh, and that's because of the defense and their, you know, some of the things that they were able to do in this game. Uh, but I think some of the takeaways from the way the offense and some of the things, some of the biggest takeaways from this offense is, number one, they are way better at dropping back and passing than they, than they are at running the football, and it's not even close. I'm not saying we need to abandon the running game at all because I feel like we've been doing a good job, especially on some of our good drives, of keeping this offense in third and short situations. And that really opens up the playbook. It lets us get in more favorable sets and more, obviously more favorable situations. But, um, you know, I feel, I'm very impressed with how we have been able to pass the ball in recent weeks at a pretty dang high level. And again, if it wasn't for some miscues in this game, the stats would have looked a lot better. Um, and again, overall, great game plan by uh, Chad O'Shea. I love his emphasis on keeping us in uh, 30 shorts, and that's where we're going to eat, um, especially in the passing game, and we've been able to do that um, at a high level. But the biggest hole on this offense right now, and again, the offensive line is is what it is, uh, but they have been playing well, But especially in the pass pro uh, section of the game. But the biggest issue with this this uh, offense right now is the running back position. And I, we talked about it previously in the show, but it is all, it is bad. It's bad. Uh, and it's not just, it's not the offensive line either. It's the running back position. I really wish Patrick would have gotten more reps in this game because Kalen Balazs, and I'm not joking around, he did not play, he just didn't play very well. Um, and that's something that needs to be fixed. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we see a little bit more of Miles Gas- Gaskin, Patrick Laird, or Layard, however you say his name, who had very good preseasons. And I think Patrick is a much better receiving threat out of the backfield than. Kalen Balaj, and that's crazy to say, but I, I, watching them both, I, I think that's very clear. Um, I mean, Patrick had two catches for 15 yards in this game. What did Kalen Balaj have? He had four catches for two yards. Like, like he just isn't. I don't know what is wrong with him. I really don't. He's. I just feel like, I think it's just time to. He's just not very good. I, I mean, I don't know else to say. But again, this offense. I thought the play calling was great. Um, I thought everything, like, um, how they handle, again, the emphasis on, you know, the third short situation and finding our identity a little bit on what we do well uh, and sticking with that. Uh, and Mike Gesicki's development in recent weeks as well. 
where he was open on some of the, like there was a play that the Colts brought a blitz and it was the play where Ryan Fitzpatrick's knee was down just short of the first down. He actually had Mike Gesicki wide open on a linebacker and he just missed him because he stepped up in the pack pocket. I guess he just didn't see him enough in time. But there were plays where Mike was open and, you know, the pick to Darius Leonard, that was a little off target where he was he was open on a little sit down route. Uh, I still feel like Mike is trending in the right direction is my point. So again, a lot of players on this offense are trending in the right direction. We talk about Devontae Parker, Mike Gesicki, um, and some of the offensive linemen like Michael Dieter, uh, uh, what's his name, Evan Boehm, or ever, uh, the guy from Texas a and that we got off the street, our center right now, and play, and play some, uh, uh Did he play? In, I feel Yeah, he did play in this game. I don't know. Did Kilgore come back? I, I would have, I, I'm, I'm spacing out on the exact set that we had. Uh, on on um, on off uh, on the offensive line in this game, but they're improving as well. Uh, just awesome day. Um, if you're a Dolphins fan, um, so yeah, again, great day. Again, the Dolphins win in an upset victory over the Indianapolis Colts in Lucas Oil Stadium, uh, which was awesome, and just a great performance by. A lot of different players in this game, and most of all the coaching staff, which I think deserves a lot of credit for this win. I think that's it, ladies and gentlemen. At least for the news you need to know about. So let's get into um, the fan Q&A, because we don't have... Uh, what was I about to say? Uh, we don't have a... We don't have a... Uh, oh, clip of the week, excuse me. So we're just gonna go. We're just gonna go with whatever. Uh, no, nah, uh, we're just gonna go to, into the fan Q&A. This first question comes from Douglas. Douglas asks, uh, "Hey Skags, how great is it to see Tannehill succeed in Tennessee? It's clearly a reflection of how bad our our, our line was and coaching staff uh, stunk. I really like the way we are trading, but it's great to see RT17 have a sec- second chance." I'm very, I'm, and he, you know, I'm like very happy for him, and I'm very happy with the way he's, you know, been able to play in Tennessee. I agree with that. It's good to see him play well because he did go through a lot when he was in Miami. That wasn't his fault. Whether it was coaches unrightfully so defending him and making him a villain in the locker room, or it was you know players for some reason you know criticizing him when he didn't deserve it. Um, you know, stuff like that. He just dealt with a lot of stupid, you know, Joe Philbin not believing in him, pulling the plug on that experiment way too early. Um, I think it was his second year in the league or something, or maybe it was his third year. Uh, just crazy stuff happening uh, with his, you know, time in Miami. Adam Gase and hit all the shenanigans and the injuries that he dealt with in the Gase era. So, yeah, it was. it's good to see him play well because, you know, we've seen that from him. Um, and it's good to see that, that he's, you know, trending in the right direction in, 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 in Tennessee. So, yeah, I would agree with that. It's, it's good to see that, uh, Douglas. Uh, this next question comes from David. David asks, or says, Does the way that Minka is playing in Pittsburgh, all pro level, make you second-guess the front office, second-guess the front office's competency? Uh, there is no safety in this year's draft as good as him. Um, I, does it, does the way, um, no, I mean, that situation could have been dealt with a lot better. I mean, Minka was my favorite player on the team. I thought he, you know, was going to be a very good player for years to come. It was the best first round pick we've selected in many years. So I, I was against it and I still, what I still am. If I could go back in time, I would change it too, but you know, the situation that the Dolphins were put in, they were very, like, I thought they were a little too soft on the situation and could have handled it a little bit more sternly. And the fact that they could have just, you know, just said no. And just just said no. Uh, and they didn't really have to compromise too much, but obviously Minka was not happy with his role in the defense and felt that he was being used in ways that he shouldn't be used in. And I completely agree with that. If you look at the way Eric Rowe has been playing at strong safety, and you can make an argument that he fits the scheme way more than Rashad Jones does with his ability to cover tight ends. 
uh, and just I feel like he fits this off. And I'm not I'm not joking. And I, I know that sounds crazy because Eric Rowe has played terrible terrible up until this point, but he's really starting to find his way at strong safety right now as like more of a Patrick Chung type of a deal where he can be versatile and cover uh, tight ends and you can put him in uh, unique situations because of that. So the fact that the Dolphins wanted Minka to do that um, and Minka was like, I'm not good in the box and they were like, well, we're, we don't care what you think. And that how that situation played out, I felt like the Dol- Dolphins definitely could have handled that better, especially with the talent that they had in the building. And yeah, I, I, I don't think I question them as much as I wish they would have been a little bit more, like I said, just st- just, just a little bit more stubborn with the way they handled it. Um, because they kind of let Minka get his way in that situation. Uh, and they could have been like, listen, I understand whatever they could have, like, they, they should have been, I understand where you're coming from, but it's not all about you. Um, it's not. Um, and I think they could have handled that better. But again, it is what it is. I don't, I don't second guess anything with the front office's, front office's decisions. Um, but that's definitely one I feel like we could have handled. It's just a very weird situation because it was coming from the player and his unhappiness with the way the team uh, and the direction the team was going. So I don't know. I don't know how you would handle that situation better. This next question comes from Gamerific. Well, I do know how they they should have handled it. Uh, they should have just been a little bit more stern with him, but it is what it is, dude. We gotta move on. I don't, I don't second guess it because it was just a weird situation. It wasn't like one day they were like, "Yeah, we Minka sucks," and they traded him. It, they knew Minka was good, uh, and that's why they wanted a first round pick for him. Uh, but it was also hit on his part as well. He just didn't want to be here anymore. Uh, the next question comes from Gamer. So no, I don't. I, for those reasons, I don't second guess uh, to answer your question, uh, David. The next question comes from Gamerific. Gamerific asks, draft time. If Joe Burrow and Tua Tagovailoa were in your hands, who would you drop, Joe or Tua? I'm going to drop Joe. I still I still feel that Tua is the best, uh, even though I feel that Joe is the second best. Um, but I, I feel that Tua is still the best. And I wish I could go deeper into that game a little bit, but I do want to get through these questions <clears throat> and talk more Dolphins here. Uh, this question comes through, well, I guess we have time. The, one of the bigger things that I noticed in that game where yards came harder for Tua and some of the throws he had to make in that game, Joe Burrow, on some of those plays, there were, there, there, his receivers were literally just wide open. Um, and that, you know, not to knock him for that, because again, he made bigger, he made some big throws in that game as well. Um... But I just feel like the situation that Tua was in with his injury and, and the way he was able to play despite of that just made me even more confident in, in his ability to be a franchise quarterback. Uh, this next question comes from Douglas. Douglas asks, uh, Hey Skaggs, it was great to see another Dolphins win today and the team fighting hard. My question for you is regarding uh, next year's draft. We have five picks the first two rounds and hopefully we hit on almost all of them. That being said, it would be hard to keep all of them uh, as the rookie contracts expire. I think it behooves us to trade back some of these picks and pick up more picks again in 2021 and 2020 so all of these prospects aren't graduating from the rookie deals at the same time. Do you agree? No, I don't agree with that. I understand where you're coming from, but I would love to have that situation where we have all of these great players and we're like, who do we pay? I hope that's what happens because this Dolphins team needs that. So no, I don't agree with that. Um... If the Dolphins end up in that situation, they did something right. Uh, this next question comes from Josh Hart. Josh Hart asks, which young players from our defense are impressing you? Uh, jo- Jamal, Jamal or Wiltz, or Jamal Wiltz, um, he's impressing me a lot. Nick Needham is playing better. Um, Jerome Baker is becoming a star, and so is Ray Guan McMillan, especially in this defense. Um, Vince Beagle is a very underrated player. Christian Wilkins is getting better. I think I think those are the guys that I know to are no, like the noticeable guys on this defense. 
this next question comes from and that was a good, and it was a good you know i think i to answer your question josh i don't know if i even said your name those are the guys that are impressing me uh this next question comes from gamerific gamerific asks do we need a running back uh maybe in the draft yes desperately this team needs a running back without a doubt without a doubt they need a running back this next question comes from david and whether it's in the draft or free agency uh gamerific somehow they need to find their guy this next question comes from david david asks our defense has been very impressive considering the talent on it Players are growing by leaps and bounds week to week. As Flores rolls out more of his playbook, do we have a second starting caliber cornerback yet? No. Uh, no. Um, I feel like that's a lot to do with coaching and development. You have a starting slot corner in Jamal Wiltz. Is Nick Needham that yet? Maybe. Maybe. I need to see more. But I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go to far, as far to say that yet. But they are turning in that direction. To answer your question, David. This next question comes from Josh. Josh asks Skaggs, thoughts on the LSU Bama game, and does it affect which quarterback should be taken in the first draft? I came into this game thinking Tua was the best. I left this game thinking Tua was the best. For those reasons, he made more tough throws and tighter coverage in this game. Um, and made more plays, in my opinion. Joe Burrow did make his plays, don't get me wrong, and I was very impressed with his moxie and his poise late in that game, um, and he just, he made the plays for, a lot of the, he made plays f- um, down the stretch for his team to win, whether he's scrambling, or he made some big-time throws, or he's making throws on the run. Now, the LSU running back had a great game as well, and so did uh, Najee Harris for Alabama, too. He had, he got them out of a lot of bad situations I'm not, uh, to be even there um, but I felt like again the situation Alabama was in and, the, and his injury and the way he was still able to play in that game I feel like again cemented the fact that he is the best and he has the best prospect now Joe Burrow showed me that yeah I have the potential and probably will be a franchise quarterback uh, and he has this Again, he reminds me of Tom Brady and the fact that he just wins games and he makes all of the right he makes big he makes big plays in big situations and uh, from the pocket, um, which I thought that was the most impressive thing about his performance against Alabama, is that's the first time we've seen again he is not the athlete that some of those other guys were at all and the elusiveness he's just a gamer and he's a pocket passer. That's the best thing that he does, and for and for him to win that game and put that much points up, and again Alabama didn't you know gave them a little you know they made their own mistakes, but he capitalized on those mistakes and he played very well. And I think the biggest thing that I take away from that game is that Joe Burrow moved himself and submitted himself to me as the number two, the clear cut number two in my opinion. This next question comes from Josh. Josh asks, what teams remaining in our schedule do you think we can beat? I mean, uh, you know, the Jets, the Bills, the Giants. Um, I can't remember the rest of our schedule, uh, but we're a tough team, man. We're, we really are. Uh, this next question comes from Chip, Chipu, or 601. He says, if we pick in the fifth place, who would you take? Joe Burrow. If And if we're five, who is over us right now? Let me see this. So let's just say the dra- the season ended right now. This is the standings right now. Cincinnati would be picking one. Washington would be picking two. Giants would be picking three. And the Dolphins would be picking four. If, I, if we were four, right, or five, because if we weren't four, then the Jets would be over us, I would take Joe Burrow. Assuming the Bengals don't take him, that's who I would. That's who I would take, and I would be very confident in that pick. I, I do. I, I Joe Burrow is really growing on me. I like him a lot. Uh, to answer your question, Chip. This next question comes from Jack Pack eighteen. Jack Pack asks, "Do you think they brought Albert Wilson back too soon? He's been a non-factor. Do you think he's not a hundred percent, or does the coaching staff not like him?" He's not 100%. He's not the same Albert Wilson that he was before he got hurt, and it's very noticeable. He just doesn't have the same explosiveness. He doesn't have the same elusiveness that he had, and it's very it's it's noticeable. And hopefully he can, can continue to try to get back to that. Um, we'll see. 
Uh, this next question comes from Gamerific. He asks, are we losing next week? I Who the heck knows? Uh, this next question comes from Jagpack18. He asks, is the secondary getting better, or are the teams they've been facing just that bad? Who from the current unit would you like to see come back next year? That's a great question. Jim Wiltz, I would like to see come back next year. Eric Rowe, in a coming-off-the-bench situation, I would like to see him uh, in, at the strong safety position. Maybe use him... Uh, as like kind of a Swiss Army knife, uh, you know, as a matchup kind of a dude, I would like to see that if he can continue to play like this on tight ends, because we tried that with Bobby McCain in the past and it just never worked. And Eric Rowe, I think, is doing a good job. Um, uh, that's about it. I mean, obviously X, you know, uh, uh, you know, Bobby's a solid player. I don't think he's going to play free safety next year though. Um, Yeah, all the other guys I need to see more of. Uh, this next question comes from Gamerific. He asks a very interesting question. He says, what is your perspective on being a Dolphins fan? Oh, man. I would say, as of right now, positive. Uh, it was very negative before this game. Um... And just before the last two games, it was very negative. Or I wouldn't say the last two games. I, you know, I saw the, you know this team getting better, but you know earlier in the season it was very negative. I really didn't trust this whole situation, what we were trying to do. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm definitely way more positive. So that's my perspective on being a Dolphins fan. Just, I'm a lot more positive than I was a few weeks ago because of the way this coaching staff has been able to craft some of these games. This next question comes from David. David asks, Caleb Blush has n does nothing extremely well. He has no innovation whatsoever to the way he runs. Does he keep the starting role while Walton is out? For the love of God, can we put someone else in? I completely agree. He His balance is... I've never seen anything like it. It's it's very bad. Um, his ability to quick cut and move side to side is very poor. Uh, when he stops his feet, he's pretty much dead to rights. He's not elusive at all. He's not a very good power back either. Uh, and again, he doesn't have very good vision. Yeah, he's not very good. And hopefully, Miles and Patrick can get a little bit more playing time. This next question comes from Edward Manning. He asks, my question is, sir, if Miami would would have gotten Rosen first, do you think they would have picked up Fitzpatrick? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Um, I think they would have. And he's having his best season. I think, out of, and I know statistically, but the way he's playing, I've never seen him play better. This next question comes from uh, John Nolan. He asks, is our shot at two over with? No, I don't I don't think so. Who knows what the Bengals... This is the only competition we have right now is Cincinnati for a quarterback. And who knows what the heck they will do. This next question comes from Mario. Mario asks, if Tua or Burrow are not available, which other quarterback would you want or player? Hmm. Um, oh God, I really wouldn't want a quarterback at that point, and I'm being honest, and that would suck. You know, that would really suck. But if we built around Ryan Fitzpatrick for a year, I'm totally cool with that either. I'm cool with that too. Um, uh... But we need a young... Obviously, we need a quarterback. Who would I want? Oh, man. That's a tough question, dude. I like Jerry Judy a lot, even though he had some drops in the Alabama LSU game. You know, C.D. Lamb, maybe uh, in like some of the later rounds or you know, at the back of the first round could be an interesting... Um, uh, you know, some of the later round picks. Um, I know this is pertaining to the first round. In terms of first-round guys, that's a tough question because Chase Young wouldn't be, you know, obviously would love to have him. Um, again, Jerry Judy's really good. Um, mm, that's a tough question, dude. I, would, I I need to look at some of the more more some of the prospects to give you a definitive answer. But the, some of the those are the guys that come to mind. This next question comes from Bahamas Dolphins. He says, do you think 
This young team is the real deal. Balaji needs to do better. Yeah, Balaji is terrible. Uh, is it the real deal? I don't know what that really means. Uh, it's a it's a dang good job by this coaching staff, dude. It really is. This next question comes from Sammy. And when I say I don't know what that means, like, is the team's real deal? I don't, like, are you talking about, like, a good team? I, you know, I don't know about all that. But, you know, I feel like, here's what I'll say. The coaching staff is the real deal. This next question comes from Sammy. Sammy asks, how in the world has Forrest taken this predominantly no-name O-line and gotten this much production out of them? It's truly impressive to watch. Side note, if Balash had an ounce of common sense to run north and south, he would have had a decent game. But I must say, he has been very disappointing to watch. Yeah, he's god awful, and I, I shouldn't say that because I, you know, I shouldn't say that. But he's not very—he's not playing very well. Uh, I shouldn't say someone's god awful. Um, but he's just in a slump. I don't know what it is because this is not the way he looked last year. So I need that Kalen Balaj to come back. This next question comes from MC. He asks, "Do you see the players getting better?" Or is it the coaching staff getting better that's making the biggest difference? Those are two in the same thing. The, f the players aren't getting better on their own. They're getting better because of the coaching staff. That's a huge plus. And the schemes, the coaching staff, all of the game plans, all of that stuff is, is good. And all of it is one in the same. And that's a good thing. Uh, and that is it for the questions, ladies and gentlemen. We've answered all the questions. Uh, I appreciate everybody asking these questions. A lot of really good questions um, today. And obviously, thank you for participating in this because it's awesome. And I appreciate everybody, everybody's questions. All of them were great questions today. Uh, oh, man, dude. What a win and what a just completely different um, viewpoint of this, the direction this team is going in. Um I mean, this team is less talented than Cincinnati, and I'm not. And I say that with all seriousness. And they're zero and nine, you know. And they would, they if they went to Indianapolis with Zach Taylor, they would have gotten destroyed. Um, and I don't, you know, people are gonna say, "Oh, the Colts, they played down to the." That's not true. They didn't. They played very hard, especially in that second half. And their game plan was like, "We're running right at you because we know you can't stop it. You, we don't. We know you don't have." The, the talent to do so. And they had success with it. But the Dolphins still were able to win the game at the end of the day. And um and I and that's 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 that speaks volumes again to, to, to where this organization is going. And the fact that he's been able to keep this locker room together and keep them fighting and you know Omar Kelly has said, well you know of course they're still fighting because they're fighting for their NFL whatever the heck. Okay, if that's the truth then they're getting better you know, and that that's because of Brian Flores and his staff. Uh, they wouldn't. I don't care how hard you play; it doesn't mean you're going to get better. They're getting better, and they're the scheme. They're playing within the scheme. All of that stuff. So, what? Just uh, I mean, I'm I'm I am dumbfounded on on just the way they've been able to just turn it around and just on its head, and how much different it is than past years in terms of why this team is going in the right direction. It's not because of we just won a game and, you know, oh, the Dolphins look good this week, but they look bad the next week. It's the progression, and they've been getting better on a consistent basis, and that's cool. And, uh, again, that's great. So let me know what you guys think about Brian Flores and the direction this team is going in in the future. and what How does, does this game change that for you? Because I'm interested to know. And, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Hopefully next week um, we're staying just as positive. I forget who we play exactly next week. Let me um, make sure I'm, I get that right. Uh, we play the Buffalo. I thought, I, thought, I thought so. We play the Buffalo Bills at home. Uh, we we could totally win that game. So hopefully we keep the good vibes going and this team continues to get better and better and better and better. And I think we get some players back this upcoming week too. So that's nice. So I'm SkyX283, and I will see you guys in. And you know what? If Brian Flores keeps this up, coach of the year, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and I'm SkyX283, and I will see you guys in the next one.